Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Friday, April 28th edition of the Basement Academy. As we wrap up our week together, and as I share another of my favorite psalms, I'm going to invite you to listen or watch all the way through. Um, Today's psalm is an important one. Uh, Again, tough choice between the five psalms of the day. But I said I'd need to talk about Psalm 88. It it speaks to things that we would often rather avoid, that we often run from. But again, the gift of praying the Psalms is every month we encounter certain realities, and Psalm 88 is certainly one of those Psalms that keeps us... um, humbled and grounded uh, in reality. And so I'm going to invite you to just listen all the way to the bitter end, okay? Hopefully it won't be bitter. It'll be a great end. Uh, So let me go ahead and read Psalm 88. It tells us that it's a song. The heading tells us it's a song. It's a psalm of the sons of Korah. So this isn't a psalm of David. These sons of Korah, the worship leaders in uh, ancient Israel. And so it was Heman the Ezraite who gave us this. Psalm 88. O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who were cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. Wow. Wow. We need Psalm 88. Don't avoid it. And you're praying the Psalms daily. When you get to 88, don't leapfrog. Read it. Pray it. Wrestle with it. Um, it's a hard Psalm, right? Um, there, there's maybe a couple hints <laughs> Of, of a couple flecks of light that shine through, but it's, it's dark, it's heavy. God's wrath sweeping over, taking companions and friends. And so Psalm 88, um, I think I, I made reference to this um, some uh, months ago when I was going through the um, questions from the academy, right? And uh, a question came, is depression reflective of a lack of faith? And I'm pretty sure I made reference to Psalm 88. And it's this, Psalm 88 gives the answer, no. (laughs) 
we would all love mountaintop, happy, clappy kind of experiences in faith. I mean, that's the, the, the church often presents that kind of thing. Let's be joyful all the time. But guess what, friends? We are not joyful all the time. And so Psalm 88 is full of faith, but, but not the happy, clappy mountaintop kind of faith. It's the scratching and clawing and persevering I'm in the valley of the shadow of death kind of faith because you are with me. And so um, let, let me just tease out a couple of the verses. There, there's really more, but, um, but, but these I, I think are verses that as I pray it, you know, I, I sometimes linger around some of these verses. Um, verse three, my soul is is full of trouble. My life draws near the grave. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit and so on. My soul is full of trouble. Psalm 88 is prayed east of Eden. We are not in the garden, friends. <laughs> Psalm 88 reminds us of the trouble that came at the tree. When Adam and Eve struck a bargain, hey, God, you've placed us here. You've given us freedom. And I know you've, you've told us not to eat that tree, but, you know, it looks really good. Um, and we heard about it. You know, we heard it can make us wise. Um, and so we're going to go for it. And, and, and God said, if you eat that tree, you're going to die. Now, now, they didn't die physically, right? We know they didn't die physically that day. But their relationship with God the relationship with each other, and their relationship with themselves. See, we don't see it quite that way. We just see the outward relationship with God. They're now hiding in the bushes. Relationship between them, kind of pointing the finger, and they're naked and ashamed. But what we don't see is the soul that becomes full of trouble, the anguish, the regret, the, the, the shame, all, all the, the, the inner uh, brokenness. And so... Um, suffering, misery, souls full of trouble. My soul is full of trouble. Any form of Christianity that does not speak to this, does not address the reality of human suffering at a depth level, not like accept Jesus and everything will be happy. It just doesn't work that way. Yes, accept Jesus. <laughs> Let him be your Lord and Savior. But our Lord comes to us as a suffering Messiah, as a suffering servant. He meets us because suffering is the human lot. It is the human condition. And so Psalm 88 keeps us grounded in a faith that is true, that is real. Life is hard. It's full of trouble. We spend a lot of our early, early years crying, right? We forget that as, as we age. We forget that a lot of our childhood years, we cry all the time. We cry because we're hungry. We cry because we need to be changed. Before we can even speak, we're crying, right? We're weeping. We cry when, you know, when our brother or sister gets more than we do. Not fair. We cry when we get you know, made fun of on the playground. We cry when our first love breaks our heart and breaks up with us, when we don't get the job, when we get cut from the team, you know, when grandparents die, you know. So as we, we forget <laughs> that we inhabit a valley of tears, a veil of tears, right? That life is hard, it's full of trouble. Now, thanks be to God where we live in America, there's a land of plenty and abundance and opportunity. And, you know, we can mitigate many of our sorrows and troubles, but we can't eliminate them. And so our physical bodies bring to us trouble and pain. Um, uh, we have mental anxiety and anguish. Uh, we struggle uh, with thoughts, regrets, anxiety, confusion. Relationships don't always work out, not just romantically, but in family context, you know, marriages struggle parent-child relationships, sibling relationships, extended family, um, even in the church family. You know, church families go through conflict. You know, I mean, 
relationships are hard. And so often people are walking through, everyone's walking through some relational challenge and, and trouble. And then there's always the specter of death, right? So we've got that to look forward to. You know, the grave looms before each of us. And so we experience that, you know, when we lose loved ones, but then we have our own appointment with the grave. And we, you know, again, Don, could you quit talking about this stuff? No. <laughs> Psalm 88 keeps us grounded. Uh, my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. And so God bless Heman the Ezraite. He lifts us up. And so this is one of my favorite Psalms, <laughs> but you're kind of wondering about me at this point, right? How could this be favorite? Because every month when I get to day 28 and, and read and pray Psalm 88, it pops any happy, clappy, you know, everything's just grand kind of illusion that may have happened. Now, I do not mean to say we can't be joyful, that we can't be excited. Of course we experience these things. Thanks be to God. But Psalm 88 brings me back. It's not that I'm always in this <clears throat> kind of emotional state, but as pastor, I work with folks. I mean, this is one of the realities of my calling, right? Anyone who's, you know, kind of therapist, counselor, teachers see this. Um, you know, medical professionals often will run into this. Um, when you see people in, in their worst and their, their hardest times, you know, you, you see people. Um, and so Psalm 88 often pray on behalf of others whom I know are struggling. And so it becomes a basis for my own intercession. Um, you have taken from me my closest friends. Loneliness is a part of the human experience. We just can't avoid it. Um, loneliness, isolation, uh, a sense of alienation, um, the, was it the old French philosophers who write about anomi, the anomi, which is where our word anonymous. To be anonymous is be, to be without a name. To be without a name is not to be known. And so anomi and alienation are on the rise. It's part of the human condition, but we often struggle with loneliness and, and, and not feeling like we're accepted as children. Again, you know, the new kid uh, on the playground, the new kid in the lunchroom, um, who's going to reach out? Increasingly, we see these things. Mental health among uh, children is, is, is suffering. As we age, right? A loved one dies, a spouse dies, we're living on our own. And just as we age, there's a lot of time spent by ourselves. Now, in between, you know, we've got lots of uh, associations and friendships, but the reality is, you know, increasingly, we find people... I'm, I'm alone in a room full of friends. There's a loneliness even when I'm surrounded by people. And so Psalm 88 gives voice to this. You have taken from me my closest friends. COVID has certainly uh, accelerated this mental health crisis. The social media, um, you know, because it presents, everybody puts their best self forward and oh, look at all how popular they are and how wonderful their life is. My life stinks. It's all a lie, it's all an illusion, right? And so uh, there's some recent studies that have come out, particularly among uh, young adolescent women, suffer most with mental uh, health struggles as a result of social media and some other, other dynamics. And so the reality is a lot of us, you know, as we age, we, we lose friends, right? Not just to death, but, but, you know, we move about. And so folks we've known in high school or college, we just might not know them anymore. And men in particular don't have many friendships. This is well documented. Uh, the Lonely American Male, I think it was a, an important study some years ago. What I find interesting in this verse, you have taken from me my closest friends. Is the psalmist blaming God? Is Heman the Ezraite blaming God? You've taken from me my closest friends. Is it that tone of voice? We don't know. What I would say, Psalm 88 is really important because it teaches us we can pray our deepest, darkest emotions. We can shake our fist at God. He can handle it. God's 
God's big enough to handle it. In fact, there are other Psalms, pour out your complaint to me. God would have us pour out our complaint. God, you've taken my closest friends from me. Why? God can handle that. We need to give voice to it. We feel it. We need to give voice to it. Um, in the morning, my prayer comes before you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why I think this is such an important psalm and why it's one of my favorites, it teaches us to pray our suffering, pray our loneliness, pray our anger, pray our sadness, pray uh, our despair, Prayer, pray our heartbreak, pray our frustration. And Psalm 88, you know, catches so much of this. It just gathers so many emotions, the darker palette of emotions. Again, there's not a lot of happy in this one, right? And so if we imagine ourselves as an artist, you know, we've got the reds and the yellows and the blues, you know, our primaries. And then you have black and white, right? And then you mix those and you get shades of color of gray. And so, and so... We know from art, it's the shadows that give depth and contour. It's the shadows that give meaning, right? And so it's the darker emotions of our lives that we struggle with knowing how to express. And so most of us live this kind of double life. We pretend to everybody that things are going well, but in reality, we know better. And God knows better, right? And so Psalm 88 is one of those psalms that there's no mask, right? There's no mask as we're going out to work, to, to the store, to church, right? Church is a notorious place where we wear our masks, you know? Everybody's happy in church on Sunday morning because if you're not happy, you don't go to church, right? And so Psalm 88 unmasks the, the prayers, right? It's just out there. It's raw. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. And so that's why I say depression is not a revealing of a lack of faith at all. In fact, so Heman Yezrite is probably clinically depressed. You know, we didn't have that designation back then, right? But he would, he would meet the criteria, my guess is, for a clinical depression. And what was his medicine? What was the therapy? What was the treatment? He prayed. And he prayed and he prayed and he persevered. Ugh. And so this is why we need Psalm 88. Again, for our own seasons of depression. Uh, how does the old song, Sweet Hour Prayer? In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. There's something about praying. We give voice to it. This is what therapy is, the talk therapy. We're giving voice to a reality. We're living behind the mask. We don't feel like anybody knows how we are. We find somebody we can speak to. Friends, you can talk to God every day. <laughs> and so in the morning, my prayer comes before you. Um, and so we need Psalm 88 and the praying repertoire. And, and I remind you of the first verse. Oh Lord, the God who saves me. <laughs> day and night I cry out before you. And so here's, yeah, God, you save me. You're, you're, God was keeping him alive, right? God will keep us alive. God will sustain us in the midst of our valleys. The last verse, you know, he, he comes back to this notion, you have taken my companions and loved ones from me. Again, the sense of isolation, loneliness, alienation, nobody kind of understands. The darkness is my closest friend. That's how the psalm ends. Oh, oh, I've got one friend in this world right now and it's darkness. Because I can't stand it when sunrise comes, you know, when we're depressed, when we're discouraged, when we're, our souls are full of trouble. The day says, how am I going to fill all these daylight hours? What am I going to do? Everybody's got something to do, not me. Everybody's happy, not me. At least when darkness comes, I can go to bed, right? And so why, you know, uh, uh, 
persistent sleep, you know, uh, sleep, increased sleep is often one of the indicators of a, a clinical depression. And so the psalmist lands in this place. The darkness is my close. I've got one friend in life and it's, it's the darkness. And I want to borrow from another psalm. And this is, again, why we pray all the psalms, because each of them is an individual friend, but together they're a collection of friends. And so they can talk to each other. Psalm 139 similarly has, has these themes of kind of some alienation, brokenness. Uh, you know, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I, I, I want to run away. But even if I run away, you're there. If I fly on the wings of the dawn, there you are. And then this, Psalm 139, verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. And sometimes that's what we want. When we're depressed, when we're discouraged, we just want the darkness to hide us. I don't have to see anybody. I don't want to go out. And so Psalm 139, sitting alongside Psalm 88, even the darkness is not dark to God. God sees us in the dark. He cares for us. He shepherds us. He's with us. He's close to us. Even if we may not feel his closeness, he is close to us. Surely I am with you always to the end of the age, Jesus said. It's in the darkness. It's in the valley. It's in the discouragement. It's in the, the seasons of, of distress and grief where we come to understand the suffering of Jesus. Jesus suffers with us. So we don't just have a Savior who suffers for us. We, we preach that all the time. He died on the cross to save us from our sins. He suffered for us, absolutely. Hallelujah. He suffers with us. And a lot of us, it's, it's hard to understand that. <laughs> Because we have to confront our own suffering and we have to be willing to bring this. Jesus, meet me in the valley. Jesus, meet me in your cross, in your suffering. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cries the Psalms on the cross. He senses the Father turning his face away, that sense of alienation from God. He's known nothing but fellowship and closeness. But as he becomes sin for the world, at that moment, God turns his face away and he receives the wrath of God. And, and so he experiences this darkness. <laughs> he experiences this isolation. He experiences this loneliness, this sense of being forsaken. That's where we meet Jesus in our seasons of distress and grief. And so Psalm 88 pulled together with Psalm 139, pulled together with Calvary, with the cross, is where we find hope. So I've gone on long. Hopefully you heeded my, my bidding at the beginning to, to listen and watch all the way through. We need to talk about this. If you are struggling, if you are sensing depression, don't hide away. Call me, contact your physician. Let's get you connected to others and let's talk more about how to pray uh, the emotional distress. Um, I, I don't think this is easy. It's not easy. But Psalm 88 keeps us grounded. And you may not feel be feeling that way now. And so what you do, your job with, with day 28, Psalm 88, is to pray for others who you know, whom you know to be struggling and suffering with depression, discouragement, and grief, and whom you may not even know. Father, whoever it is in the church family, whoever it's in my family, whoever it is this day, touch them and bring hope to them in the midst of their darkness. Give them light. So, friends, for these and many other reasons, this is why Psalm 88 is one of my favorite psalms. Let's pray. I'm on the verge of tears. Lord, thank you for this psalm. And for even the Ezra, right, and his willingness to put it on paper, he didn't have to do that. But by the power of your spirit, you moved his pen and this, this psalm has been recorded and how this psalm has given voice to so many who have suffered 
and struggle with depression. So Lord, help us. Help us in our seasons of distress and grief, in our depression, in our valleys. When it feels like the darkness is the only friend we have, Lord, we thank you that the darkness is not dark to you. It shall shine like the day. And so Jesus, come close in your suffering and your wounds and your pain and your anguish. Draw close to any who are listening and watching even now. And those in our families, in our circle of friends and acquaintances that we know are struggling, Lord, draw near to them this day and give hope and use us with our prayers and our calls and our visits and cards and encouragement to give hope to those who struggle. Lord, hear our prayer as we make it in the name of the suffering and risen Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God draw close to you this day and every day and on your darkest day. May God draw close through Jesus Christ. Amen.